as we go. I see the green thumbs up. Should I begin presenting or should I wait for folks to join? Ready to learn. Hello, everyone. I'm also excited about this topic. All right, I will jump right in. I think I, I have the green light to go and I believe this is being live streamed, so no pressure. Um, anyway, thank you all for joining my talk uh, today from wherever you are. I know this is a, a global event and thank you so much ADP List for hosting this incredible event and having us all here and bringing us all together and offering a platform for mentorship. And um, I, I'm really excited to be a part of this community. And I'm also really excited to talk to you about design and machine learning, which are two of my favorite topics. I'm new to machine learning, not new to design. I'll get into that in just a moment. But going into the first slide, I'll talk a little bit about myself so you can have some context about where I'm coming from, where I've been. My name is Natalie Kuhn. I use she, her pronouns. I'm located in New York City, and I'm a director of design within machine learning for Capital One, which is a new and emerging space for designers. It's not necessarily a new and emerging space for product and technology individuals. So I will speak from a design point of view throughout this presentation. And um, I'm also really into service design. I co-founded the New York chapter of the Service Design Network, and I'm also accredited within service design. If you haven't heard of service design, it's really systems thinking, looking across people, process, platforms to design touch points, products, and services across all of those things. And I should have said, if you haven't heard of Capital One, that's a financial institution offering products to consumers and businesses, primarily out of North America, but we also have some offices globally. So I've been working for Capital One for a while and um, really excited to be working within their machine learning space. And again, I'm, I just recently joined ADP List as a mentor and you can chat with me more there. So if you want to have a conversation, that's where I'm going to direct you, FYI. And jumping right in, I would say when I looked up this number about how many decisions adults make in one day, I, I felt the weight of this number, 35,000 decisions. It's no wonder that we're looking at machine learning, artificial intelligence, and looking at technology to help us make these decisions. Whether these are small decisions, something like going to a restaurant to eat, um, or making a big life decision about where you're going to live or looking at making a big financial investment. These are a lot of different things that you are flooded with data and information to try to figure these things out. And it can become very overwhelming, let alone if you're running a business, if you're within healthcare, financial institutions, looking at the government and law and all the different places where there are some really big decisions being made. And there's a lot of data that we need to go through in order to understand. And it becomes really unwieldy when you look at it from purely a human perspective. And so specifically talking about machine learning, and again, I'm newer to the space of machine learning. We can have a discussion at the very end. My understanding is that it's a subset of artificial intelligence. So I'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and machine learning throughout, but machine learning as a simple definition is really the study of algorithms um, or computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience with data and, and training information. So giving that information to the algorithm or the model and having it learn and provide outputs as it relates to predictions, decisions that then either it might act on or in working with partnership with a human, then the human can make that final prediction or that final decision. And over the last year, that's really been the, the biggest part of this conversation is who is it the machine or is it the human? Is it a combination of both gets to make that final say in, in what's what's happening? And then when it comes to what, it, what went into that final decision, sometimes these scenarios can create a black box of really not understanding or being able to explain the output that a machine provided, which these themes will come up throughout the presentation, but I'd say those are the two areas of conversation that come up again and again, is who, machine or human, and then process-wise and data-wise, how are we going about coming to that conclusion and what data are we using and how are we using it? 
And here is a little bit of progress uh, that we've been making at a really high level, going from games to looking at 200 million proteins more recently. I, I don't know how closely you all, if, if you're joining this talk, you might be incredibly passionate about machine learning or AI and be following all of this news. Um, if not, here's some, some information for you to process. AlphaGo was created in 2017 and became the best Go player in history and was beating humans who were worldwide champions back in that time. So we were talking about games and, and algorithms really working in more of a, a strategic lens, but for something that is more for play uh, for an extent. And then looking at uh, Dolly, I don't know if folks have had a chance to check that out. It came out in 2021. And it's a tool in which you can provide through natural language uh, description, and it will give you a, an image. And some would argue that it's art, and it combines these concepts. And if you've done it before, some of it is quite chilling um, and, and quite uh, fascinating how it puts together the words that you're using into something um, that you might have been able to imagine or, or not. And that's a pretty huge advancement. And then looking at AlphaFold, which is a more recent um, algorithm that has identified, again, 200 million proteins that exist, and that data will help medical researchers develop new drugs and vaccines for years to come. So that's a little bit of a spectrum of how quickly things are moving in the sense of uh, where we're taking machine learning and AI. Some other examples, I mean, really any industry that you look is using uh, machine learning to some extent. And I was surprised to learn about John Deere, although they've been working within machine learning and AI for the past decade, investing in that to become a data-driven business. It didn't intuitively come to me that farming would be a place using such high technology. And it's really incredible the work that they've been doing in order to prepare for when our population reaches 10 billion, as projected in about 30 years. So thinking about all the different places in which we can use machine learning and AI to support ourselves, uh, to make better decisions, um, there's a lot of positive, there's a lot of excitement around this technology. And so I want to make sure to talk about the two sides, because a little bit about um, that I'll talk through today is around some of the, the opportunities that we have to be better. But these are some of the exciting things that you can see within machine learning and artificial intelligence. And just to be more specific about John Deere, they're, they're looking at using um, applications to self-drive their vehicles so they can be watching almost, I imagine, like a, a Roomba might clean your house. Um, they're watching their, their trucks work with the crops and they can get a lot of data from that um, and, and better automate their processes to be more efficient and more informed than they could if they were doing all of these things manually. And then when I think about my own excitement about travel and about experiencing the world and new things, these are just a couple different examples of travel applications. Maybe you've used them. I hadn't used them before. This was just through my, my research of understanding all the different opportunities here. Uh, but Hopper is a, a tool that can predict with 95% accuracy a year in advance when it comes to flights and hotels. And so that's something that can help you make decisions as it relates to your financial ability and interest in traveling. And then Barb uh, is an intelligent um, platform that matches travelers with hotels that suit their individual needs. And again, I was looking through it as many examples as I could find, and this was a tiny sliver of what's out there. So I highly recommend if this is something interesting to you to continue to look and, and study and understand all of the different tools that are out there that are leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then I will switch gears a little bit to talk about the other side of the coin, or I would say more of the, the risks and, and dangers. And as much as this is such an incredibly exciting time, and it almost feels as though a lot of the opportunities are really, really endless, and, and there's, no, uh, there's no height to which we can't climb with uh, this, this technology, there are also some dangers. And the risk in the, the information, the data and activity that we're getting from users is not only the thing that is most powerful that enables these things to work, but it's also one of the biggest risks. And being in this space where we're still learning about data privacy and sharing our information and what it means and how it can be used not only to help us, but there are a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of side effects that we're just starting to understand and learn today 
even as we continue to excel and speed up in the usage of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So there's there are a lot of, I, I would love to even draw a better picture, maybe we can do one together about all these factors of the, the rate of change within this technology, the learning that we're having kind of as it's happening, it's all, again, very exciting, but um, an opportunity to, to look out and see how we can be more accountable. And these three different buckets are more, I would say, broad themes. If you have been paying attention to the news, um, if you've been conducting any of this research yourself, you'll notice these ties, or I would say maybe I should, these paradoxes between social media and mental health really this opportunity for hyper-personalization and this opportunity to connect and have information very accessible, easy to get to, easy to share with one another. But then there's also the, the side of anxiety and depression and misinformation and the opportunity that you have on social media or that social media has with you to um, not only sway decisions when it comes to shopping, but possibly elections or, or perspective of the entire world as it exists today. I mean, there's a lot that is is positive, uh, that could be positive with social media and a lot that could be really risky. And so making sure that we're looking at both sides when we have these conversations. And similarly with the other two themes, looking at how convenient it is to buy things these days. You get something in two hours, two days, anything you want um, is really anything you want. It's it's really wild. Um, but then looking at the, the harm on our small businesses, looking at the packaging waste or the bad worker conditions for some of these organizations that are providing such an incredible service. And then finally, one that's newer to me, just around predictive policing and this ability to um, really try to, to get someone for a crime that they haven't committed yet and, and where the bias is there and where's the discrimination. And, and there is a lot of research that's newer around that, around how we apply these tools when it comes to the law, um, when it comes to how we're, we're looking at um, punishment and um, crimes that, again, predictive policing was an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Um, if you want to look at that, there's, there's just a lot um, that we're trying to figure out in this space. And so as I was going through and really understanding more broadly what was happening outside of my space and my team that I'll get into in just a moment, it was interesting to me to see the contrast between some of the really scary negative things that are happening, but also this um, this trying to change for the better. And I kept thinking again and again, are we doing enough? And additionally, when we make changes, like I think, and I didn't list it on here, but Microsoft's chatbot years ago that was taking Twitter data and was learning from the Twitter data and became racist um, and they had to take it down. And so are we doing enough? And when harm like that is done, can you take it back? And looking at where we're putting machine learning and artificial intelligence, how do we be more proactive ahead of time instead of a lot of this is released and we've created things and then how do you scale that back if it has unintended consequences that are quite harmful? And so these are the questions that come up for me as I look at the industry. And, and I guess one more thing to say about all of these um, is this idea, I look at the, the last um, little note here about um, AI needing both uh, a pragmatist and blue sky visionary. So both looking at the side of the risks and the dangers, but also being optimistic about the future that we have here and the, in this space. And so I try to figure out where, where my role is as a designer in all of these different environments and, and what can I be doing more of? How can we be defining better regulation, law, privacy, um, a lot of different ways that we can better manage what we're doing here. Oops, too far. Um, and so one of these things I was thinking about, somebody brought to my attention about the number of years that we've had automobiles before cars, before seatbelts. And that really struck me. And I did a little bit of research. And in 1886 was when we had our first cars. It wasn't until 80 years later that there were seatbelts enforced in cars. And there's actually a myth that it was safer to not have a seatbelt because if you're flung from the vehicle, then if the vehicle explodes into flames, you're actually safer. 
um, which in living in this day and age, I found that insane. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe a lot of you all don't believe in seatbelts. I, I personally believe in seatbelts um, from the data that I'm seeing online. But um, it was just interesting to me, the delay in the, the safety and precaution for, uh, and I didn't even look up airbags, um, but the safety and precaution was such an emerging technology that became accessible to everyone. And yet there wasn't a lot of safety um, actually done. And they had in, it was 1922, so 1886, and then 1990 or 1922, they had seatbelts in professional races like the Indy 500, but not for um, other vehicles. That wasn't until 1970 was, it was more universally, or I should say, um, at least my research was in the U.S. Um, 84 years later, they had seatbelts required by law. Um, so anyway, the point of that is that regulation and legal policy are often way behind new technology. And so that's where we are with these technologies, is trying to figure out around ethics and what is the right thing to be doing. And if the regulation isn't there, how are we accountable as individuals working within that space? Is there an algorithmic risk impact assessment as we're doing this? How do we better foresee unintended consequences and put in um, more ability to prevent those things from happening? Or if they do happen, how do we have better damage control or how do we manage um, if something goes wrong? I think these are a lot of really big questions that we're trying to figure out how to operationalize responsible AI, things like that. And so real quick, again, I've been a designer my entire career, but this is a brand new space. I've been working in, in UX. I have a background in research, in systems design. All of these things have culminated really into my passion to understand these latest and greatest technologies, to understand machine learning. And that has brought me to the current team that I'm on within machine learning, within Capital One. And so again, new to the space, would love to chat with you all. But this talk will be primarily around what I've learned over the last year. It's been a lot of exploration leading within a nascent machine learning team. It's been reflecting on those successes and failures. And it's been looking at the future. What are we going to do next with what we've learned? What does it mean for designers? Again, I have that perspective being that's the discipline that I sit within. So I'll go through. All this, when it comes to just another way of looking at machine lear learning versus traditional programming, for me, it took a moment to recalibrate. Since I've worked with engineers, um, uh, software engineers, um, individuals who are, are working within traditional programming for the majority of my career, as well as product donors and other disciplines, researchers, but to switch my brain in working with a new kind of individual who is thinking about machine learning, this was a helpful way to really overly simplify the difference between the two. When you look at traditional programming, you're looking at putting rules and data into that and getting answers. And then with machine learning, you're looking at putting answers and data and outputting rules uh, when it comes to predictions and decisioning. So that was one way that I, I started to think about this differently. And working in this team, I've been studying the more detailed process of creating a model. And so looking at what, what does that loosely look like? I, I want to also say, caveat this with, it could look a little bit different depending on the company and what the organization is trying to achieve and who they have on the team. And, and there are a lot of, but this is my loose understanding of the process when it comes to defining the intent of what you're trying to do with that model, thinking about these big exploratory questions around um, what, what would be the most ideal state for an output of this model, and then sourcing and prepping data. Many, many data sources, possibly, um, where's that coming from? How are we using that? Creating features, and this is something that I've been learning a lot about is the development of features or calculations that go into building and training models, and then look looking at how do we evaluate the success of a model. And if it is successful, moving on to documenting, looking at the versioning, the lineage, is this something that other groups could be using? Is this something that has certain security that not everyone should have access to? There are a lot of considerations when it comes to the process of creating this model. And through evaluation, maybe there's some iteration going back, 
um, and then deploying and then consuming and monitoring those models and learning a lot about from a, a data science perspective, what are those high points? Like what are the exciting moments during that process? And um, from what we've been learning, it's really that moment of defining the intent, exploring a space and trying to understand what is it that we're going to be creating within this model? What is success building and training consuming those three areas are, are very exciting. And then as you would expect um, with anything that you could draw parallel to when it comes to sourcing and preparing or documenting, um, that is a lot less glamorous as you can imagine. Um, so this is loosely what it looks like to create a model from, from my brief experience. And then again, I mentioned how getting to know data scientists and really trying to empower them with tools and products, I'll get into my role as a designer, uh, it's just been a, a mental model shift around who I'm talking to, what they're skilled at, how they want to work, and I'm learning new things every day. And so I was directed to this, this um, data scientist Venn diagram. It's from 2013, but it still resonated with me looking at um, the different combinations of, uh, and here it's simply the math and the statistics is really only the machine learning part. But when it comes to data science, the science part about discovery and building knowledge and looking at motivating questions about the world. I mean, these are things that this framework was helping me wrap my head around my new teammate or partner or person that I was trying to create things for, um, which is a good segue into what we've we've been doing as designers. Um, but there are a lot of different folks involved within the model development process, including risk, including legal, including different um, development teammates from, from software engineering as well. So it's not just data scientists who are working with models in, in case uh, you were thinking that. It's a lot of different individuals. They have a lot of different roles um, and they have a lot of different contributions throughout. So that's a little bit vague as I learn more. Um, I'll continue to inform you all. And then what has design been doing? Um, it is, and I'll get into the, the learnings and the opportunities and successes a little bit different from what I originally had anticipated, but still incredibly informative. And so what we've been doing as a design team has been creating process, tools, and platforms to empower model creators and model consumers. I didn't put data scientists in front of either of those um, because from a, a model creator standpoint, it's primarily data scientists within the organization that I work, uh, but there's some other individuals involved. And then from a consumer perspective, it's not also always data scientists. There are also business analysts and, and other individuals consuming. So I've really bucketed it into two really high level archetypes of people that are creating models and people who are consuming models. And what we've been doing, again, as in design has been creating things that empower them to do their job. And that's just where we are today. This is a brand new team, more to come. Um, and so what we've really learned from that is uh, that was not what a lot of us expected we would do. I think a lot of us uh, expected to work alongside data scientists making models, but that hasn't been the opportunity yet for us. And I think also looking back to that other slide, that would be incredibly hard to just jump in without even understanding what a data scientist does or without understanding some of the ecosystem of how models are created. So in a way, it would have been naive to just jump in as a designer without a background in machine learning and start helping with uh, creating models. So I think that what we've been doing has actually been the best 101 um, in terms of learning about machine learning without being classically trained. And I also, that's something when it comes to recruiting, I would love to have a discussion with you all about, are there machine learning designers out there? Is that a, a whole segment that we have not been able to find yet? Because from my understanding, at least in the communities of design that I sit within, there are individuals who are expert in that yet. Um, so that's something that I think is very emerging. There's a clear partnership between these disciplines, but it just hasn't come to light uh, quite yet. Uh, but I, I really believe it is, and I feel excited for that time. So yeah, this is uncharted territory, new space for design. 
Um, and the, the ideal would really be if we could work alongside those folks and have those conversations about ethics, about accountability, about um, what we're creating, why we're creating it, and how we're doing that from the very beginning, because we have that background as designers as being advocates for the user or the customer, the human being, and making sure that um, from research and our understanding, we're doing our best to serve them. And um, so I would love to, again, work more closely with data scientists in that way. And it that led me to a really exciting out of the blue conversation, which maybe it was just, I don't, I don't know, I don't believe really as much in fate, but um, I was having this moment where, you know, maybe we're just, the industry's not ready for that conversation, for designers to be um, creating models with alongside folks. It's just, we'll create the platforms and tools for people to use to do those things. And I got a call from, um, or I was connected to someone and I got on a Zoom call with a data scientist looking to understand research and design to be a more empathetic uh, data scientist in her day to day. And so she had already proactively identified that there was a clear opportunity to have both of us benefit from partnership. And um, I got really excited about that. It's really, I feel like there are just these light signals about the opportunity for design in this space. And um, it just, it was very, I, I was telling her we connected immediately and um, I said, maybe we could do a talk someday, a data scientist and a designer and how we work together. And she was excited about that. But I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there. It just hasn't been fully fleshed out, fully designed, um, I would say created or defined is the word I was looking for. So I feel really excited about that. Um, I'm working in machine learning. It's just uh, making the platforms and tools. And so that's in terms of the successes, I would say as a design team, we're doing what we've always done. We're aligning products, platforms to the needs of our customers who are data scientists, business analysts, um, sometimes uh, software engineers within this space. We're teaching the space in machine learning about what design can do, which is something that we've always done. I think paving the way for design in this new space and anything that I can learn that I can share with you all, again, regardless of if you're a designer, um, but I, and I am one, so that's how I, I talk about it, but creating these case studies for how we can work together in this space, how we can get started in such an important emerging technology, and then thinking critically about the future and how we can all be accountable. So those are a lot of the successes. And I think these opportunities to become subject matter experts in machine learning, to really try harder. I've been taking courses and, and I was never good at math. And so I'm, I'm really struggling with the, the plotting and the patterns and, but I mean, I think it's, we've got to learn it. It's whether it's today or, or when it's a part of our job description, but um, I think becoming subject matter experts, really pushing the envelope and how we're organized, how we operate, how we work together and defining that ideal engagement and that ideal pod. Um, and yeah, future, hopefully working alongside data scientists instead of just creating platforms for them. Um, let's see what else, future. So what I would say in terms of where our team is going from here, we have a lot new perspective every day, every week, every month. We're learning more about what we can do and what we can offer this space. We're learning more about the business needs, how we can achieve our goals, our objectives, our key results, really improve the space of machine learning overall. And as the organization matures and we're continuing to get more and more into machine learning, all these things come together to create our, our opportunities to test and learn new things, new organizational structures, new ways of scoping our work, new application of design methodology and research methodology, new engagement models, increasing our case studies, um, socializing that work and continuing to teach one another. And so that's really what we've been doing. And I would say my learning is a, a subset of what we plan to do as a team and I would say so far, I think these are the four areas that not just a designer, I would say anyone who is interested in machine learning where we really need to get stronger and to be successful um, are any, any courses you can take, any presentations you can attend, conferences like this where you can get exposure to lots of different folks from different backgrounds and disciplines within the space to understand how to use data as a raw material. What are the opportunities there? What are the risks? What is right? What is wrong? Like really creating within that space. Thinking about systems. If you um, have heard of complexity theory, um, anything that really helps you understand how different 
platforms, different processes, and different um, structures are connected. And, and looking at that high level complexity, how do we do that? Um, looking at law and ethics, that's something that unfortunately as a designer, it's not, um, I feel like it should be at this point, maybe for all of us, I, I look at, at product and uh, technology uh, partners and teammates that I work with, but we're not trained in the law or ethics, yet what we're creating has direct ramifications and is related really closely to some of these areas now. The gap between is, is closing. And so how do we understand what it means to be ethical within these spaces? And then finally, being influencers for change. And I think that because design as a discipline continues to expand and, and transform into a more comprehensive space and design strategy being an opportunity that we've all been leaning into, how do we really change organizations to leverage this more human-centered approach across everything that we do, not just the more traditional product designer, the traditional UI, UX, um, or even what's becoming more traditional to me in service design, but how do we become influencers in this brand new space within machine learning and artificial intelligence? And just to wrap up, um, as, as you already noticed from your day-to-day -day and or from this presentation, um, there's no turning back. Uh, we're going forward with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So all these huge companies are using these tools in some way, and it's really an opportunity for us and, and even more that are not listed. I didn't have John Deere on here. I should though. Um, but yeah, we got we to gotta figure out all of this together um, and do the best that we can to do right by all the humans that uh, are being impacted, which is really all of us, um, by these technologies. And so that's really, I guess, my call to action is to continue to talk about these topics. Again, I'm not an expert in this space. I just wanted to share my point of view as a designer and what I'm learning um, in joining. And I encourage you all to do the same. I'd love to learn from everyone who's joined today and, and form community around what we can all be doing from our different backgrounds to support uh, a better space here. I think my last slide, I can put this, I'll figure out a way to put it in the chat um, and or if this presentation goes out afterward, uh, you can take a screenshot if you want also. But here's some starter resources um, if you're new to machine learning, um, some different places that you can look, whether you are a reader, reader someone who likes movies, articles, um, there's quite a range within this. And that's really it. I, I can... Um, did I have one more slide? Oh, yeah. And we'll just have a discussion now. I think I stopped screen sharing. But really, thank you for listening today. I know that these are a lot of ideas and concepts and things that are new and forming. So i um, just excited to share a messy rough draft with you all. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Nestle. Thank you for talking to all of us on this super exciting topic. We have so many questions in the Q&A section. Um, but I guess firstly, just wanted to ask right on behalf of everybody, will you be able to share the presentation with us? Maybe, you know, post it on your Twitter or something so that we can all get a grab a copy. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I realize yeah, I should have been you. looking up here the whole time. Yes, I can do that. I can share on my Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is N4T4LI3. Um, it was also in the deck, but I'll put it in the chat. So I'll share awesome. it on there if you'd like. Yes, please. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I think everybody, you can, if you want to get a copy of Natalie's deck, do follow her on Twitter. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Q&A. Uh, I think um, we'll try, try to cover as many as possible. A lot of this is regarding, I guess, you know, what is the implication of machine learning for, uh, you know, like designers and their career. Uh, the first one is from Claudia, and she's asking, how do you predict designer roles to shift in the future, especially when thinking about AI with art and writing? Sure. I would say broadly to answer the first part of that question, when it comes to predicting the shift in designer roles, that slide that I showed about being really comfortable with using data as a raw material, what does that even mean? Like how, how do we become more um, comfortable in a space that is a lot more technical? And I would say understanding systems and, and looking at 
opportunities to lean in on service design, understanding the people, the platforms, the process, the connective tissue between all those things, the relationship of data pipelines into these features, these calculations, into these models. I think it's going to be important to be a lot more uh, technically savvy in ways that we might not have been before. And similarly around ethics and understanding um, how to stand up for ourselves if we see something that doesn't seem right. Um, how, how can we be confident in, in making those call outs and, and working with our team for positive change? And then when it comes to AI with art and writing, um, that's a, a wonderful uh, part of the question also. I don't know that I would change my response actually when it comes to art and writing. I think that um, for some reason it makes me think of, of NFTs and, and really responsibility or accountability around um, ownership over art and writing and, and how people um, can be artists and, and writers and, and maintain the um, maintain their work and, and not be taken advantage of is what that makes me think of. Um, but I would say that in the, the same way, I think we need to become more systems thinkers, more um, understanding of, of what data is, what machine learning is, what AI is, um, and then laws and, and ethics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think a lot of people are kind of worried that AI is going to take over the, the, the job, right, in tech. So what's your view on that? How will this uh, AI affect tech jobs in the long term? I think it will change them. I don't think it will eliminate them. I think that a lot of the, the biggest benefits of machine learning are around more rote tasks or more manual tasks that, um, from what I've understood, folks didn't want to do anyway. But um, I mean, I see the concern. I don't want to invalidate that. But my understanding is it will make us all be more strategic or that we can oversee some of these models and these machines. And that was um, one of the, the talks that I had attended recently was around operationalizing artificial intelligence. And they were talking about the relationship of a doctor and artificial intelligence. And the AI will never replace a doctor. Like, and, and similarly with tech jobs, I don't think an AI could replace an entire job. I think that it could make those jobs more strategic and more oversight of something in a model in machine learning and um, oversight with the algorithm. So I think it would make those jobs um, just different in the sense of being able to understand those things, but I don't think it will eliminate and I don't think there's going to be a burst. I think it's of a bubble. I think it's just going to change what we're being asked to do and be more strategic. We'll yeah. see. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Totally agree. Um, I think uh, the next question I would like to perhaps bring is um, about this one. Uh, with the recent concerns over bias in AI, how can one how can one make sure to design their AI so that the information in surfaces is neutral? That comes in. That is the that is the question of this whole talk and the whole world right now. I think that's on everyone's mind. I think when it comes to a diverse set of data, and looking and what does that mean? I mean, that's the question. I think having a diverse set of data is is key. But the context of what that means depends on what you're trying to do. I guess when I think of financial services, in looking at um, different credit histories or, or different contexts or different scenarios. But I think um, it's going to come down to having a variety of examples and not having one set of an entire population that you create an AI and base it on that. But it really depends on the context of where, where you're talking. But I think the diversity within the data set um, would be key. Um, and yeah, that it's neutral. I mean, yeah, this is the biggest risk. That's why I'm struggling to answer it a little bit, just because this is what we need to figure out how to be better at. Um, so thank mm. you for the question. Mm, definitely a tough, tough question. Um, okay, I would like to show this question, um, which is, you know, as an intermediate level UI UX designer uh, for enterprise facing app, how should I show my capability and potential for job opportunities at AI ML industry? I guess, you know, how do people break into this space, right? This really new and exciting space. 
that is a another great these are all great questions um i would say if you can move if you can build relationships within your existing company and show proficiency within what you do today and build that trust of ability to learn and ability to conduct um, design work that's a part of it i think that's a little bit of how i was able to break in is just over long-term success and and showing up um, in my job but also more specifically being able to talk about your work from that systems perspective or looking at when i think of a ui ux designer what was the data that came from the behind i love the cat also um sorry but (laughs) hello use cat um but yeah in terms of like trying to get more information when you are designing as a UI UX designer, asking more questions of your teammates in terms of your more technical teammates, whether you're working with software engineers or data scientists today, and asking them about when you create that design, what is going into it? Ask them about the data, really like teach yourself about what is needed to empower the products and the tools that you're creating. And think about like, look up service design and think about how do you create a mapping and, and, and show that you understand not only the front end, but you also are starting to understand, you don't have to be um, a data scientist necessarily just to break in, but how can you show understanding and capability of that complexity, the systems thinking, the data that goes into the tools that you're designing for? I think that would be something that you would want to create a portfolio about that highlights those those ways that you can think a little bit differently or deeper um, about the work that you're doing. Got it. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Yeah, the next question I want to uh, bring up is from Nian. So she's asking, have you been in situations where you had to ethically advocate for advancements in AI ML experiences against business expectations and needs? If yes, how did you navigate this effectively? Um, or would you have done it differently? Another tough question, I think. I know this is a great one. Also, um, I, I have not personally. I have spoken to others who have. I've been lucky. Um, I think that's not going to be the case for the rest of my career, uh, whether here or elsewhere. But I, I think that um, I'll tell you more about that when it comes up. I would say, though, I would probably, if it was me, use the skills that I've used to influence when it comes to other projects in which we were trying to develop a product or a service that did not meet user needs and using research and using data and calling out the risks of creating something that in this situation, again, I'm speaking more abstractly, but if we do this wrong, this is the risk that I think, unfortunately, sometimes folks respond to fear um, and they respond to the the rim like warning about what could happen um, and I think using um, our skills around influence and facilitation and leveraging research and data as best that we can to show the the downsides and the dangers um, and if something does happen I mean reputational risk is something that um, companies are and, and should be taking more seriously so that's I would I would definitely lean into that. Um, but I'll have maybe more examples later uh, as I continue. Yes, totally. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time. So we have a lot of questions we couldn't cover still, but hopefully this is helpful to people. Uh, and uh, again, you know, feel free to, uh, you know, grab a copy of Natalie's deck on, uh, we, uh, on, we, uh, by adding her on Twitter. And uh, I look forward to, you know, seeing all of you uh, at other sessions in Divor and potentially hosting Natalie again uh, at yeah. another ADP this event. Great, thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Bye.